little awkward for me, so I'm not exactly for sure uh, where I'm supposed to be looking, but hello. We have the uh, distinct honor and privilege of having Molly DeWitt with us today. She's certainly not a stranger to First Pres. She's uh, a friend and has spoken here before, and she is with uh, Director of Camp Pioca, so program, program Director of Camp Pioca, and so we welcome her. Also, I want to take just a minute to um, call your attention. I might be getting just a little bit of out of order here, but I'm uh, trying to get my feet wet again as being a liturgist. Um, I want to call your attention to the happenings at First Pres, uh, especially the Elder of the Week, should you be in need of any type of uh, pastoral or uh, concerns or care. It's Michael Thyssen. His uh, information is probably online. It's also in your program. Also, I want to point out that, uh, and I've not seen this before, this is pretty neat. Today we will be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and we have a very uh, neatly compacted uh, juice cup, and also on the top, it's two layers, is bread. So if you take a look at it, if you haven't uh, received one yet, so this is what it looks like. Your bread is on top, and then the juice. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship and to hear the word of God. Will you join me in the call to worship? God calls us to gather and celebrate all that God has done, is doing, and promises to do. As we come together in worship, I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Just when life seems mundane and routine, just when we accept things as inevitable, Who knows what the next hour will bring?
Please stand if that's comfortable for you and join me in the call to confession. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God in confidence. Confident in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have refused to hear the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Please be seated. Okay, this is where I was supposed to say the words of welcome and uh, also the announcements. But again, it's uh, very nice and we're very thankful to have the Reverend Ro Molly DeMitt with us today. And also... Michael Thyssen is the elder on call. As we open the pages of scripture, let us pray that God will speak across the distance and call us to new life and faithful serving, living. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may hear with joy what you say to us today. The first lesson today is a responsive reading taken from Psalm 103. Please join me in offering these ancient words of praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Who forgives all your inequity? Who heals all your diseases? Who satisfies you with good as long as you live?
people of Nineveh. And Jonah did go, finally, and prophesy. And uh, the people of Nineveh repented, and God spared them. And this is what happens after that encounter. The word of God. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. And also many animals. This is the word of God. We have a really great tradition in our senior high camp when we are able to operate summer camp in a regular year. For those of you who may not know, uh, we were not able to operate summer camp at Pioca this summer in person. I'm not sure how this tradition started or how long it's been happening, but every night after our all camp activity and snack, our senior high campers come together as a group for an activity called Relationship Wrap. I know it sounds thrilling. When I was a camper, I grew up with something similar, but we called it Open Forum. It is a space for campers to ask really difficult questions of one another and other counselors um, in a safe area in which they know that they all are welcome and feel loved and trusted. At Pioca, we give our high school campers the opportunity to ask absolutely any question to the group. And I, I mean anything. They are able to submit their questions throughout the day in a little box and it doesn't matter how silly or outrageous they may be. We review the questions to just make sure that they're appropriate throughout the day. And then at night, we all gather together and get to look at all these questions. And they range from things as outrageous as, is water actually wet? To very serious questions that they're grappling with, such as, am I a bad Christian because I don't like going to church? And when we gather, this is typically 45 to 50 high school campers asking these tough questions of one another with a little bit of guidance from some adults. It's just absolutely amazing to watch. The adults, unless asked, really don't contribute all that much. We are there to kind of facilitate and guide, but we lay out the space so that the youth feel open enough to ask one another what they believe, why they believe it, and feel so in a safe space among their peers. Now I think in our adult world, 
Are there many spaces like that for us today? Are there spaces for you to be free to express your feelings and beliefs without the judgment or chastisement of others? Is there anywhere you feel safe enough? Like I said, we had to cancel our in-person summer camp, so this summer we sent out a camp in a box to all of our campers, and inside they got all kinds of activities and swag, but they also got a daily devotional where they, for over the course of a week, were able to dive in deep to this summer's theme, which was, this is our prayer. Today's text from Jonah comes from day three of this summer's curriculum. And on this day with our kids, we focused on the themes of managing our emotions with our littlest campers, and we talked about lament with our older campers. Each day viewed prayer as a means of longing for God and communicating with our Creator. This particular day's theme is longing to be heard, and I can't help but wonder when I read this scripture passage Who are we talking about? God or Jonah? We come upon Jonah at the end of his story, which is a very interesting one from a biblical perspective. Every other book of the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament is a prophetic oracle, which is bits of prophecy that are revealed by God coming out of the mouths of various prophets. But not Jonah. Jonah is the story of a prophet, and so we don't see him prophesying much like other prophets. What we do see him doing is a lot of running, a lot of pouting, and just being absolutely filled with emotion. It's hard to place this book in history because there's no particular era where scholars agree that it is from. And since it's more of a story than a book of prophecy, a lot of people don't really know what to do with it. There are a lot of ways to categorize it. It could be seen like a parable. Yet like Jesus' parables, there's a lot we can take and interpret in different ways when we look at Jonah. So what is the meaning we're supposed to take away? I'll reveal my bias to you. As with any reading of the Bible, I tend to interpret the word differently based on where I'm at in my life. And so the story of Jonah told to me as a child was absolutely wild. A story about a man who got scared, got swallowed by a fish, but then inevitably did what God asked of him. But now as an adult, when I went back and I continued reading beyond the end of chapter 3, I find Jonah quite shocking But he's not the first prophet to shock me or continuously shock me throughout my life. The prophet Hosea tells us that he marries a prostitute and then he berates her and his people to make an example of Israel. I struggle a lot with our prophets because I know that they're flawed people that God is still able to use and do God's work in the world. And yet there are also people that are in positions of power. And flawed though they may be, I believe God is calling them to be better and not be excused for their poor behavior. What we see in their relationship with God is what I would call righteous accountability. They are not held above the people that they serve. Rather, they're called to live just as righteously as the people that they are called to prophesy to. So at this point in scripture, we find out that Jonah is mad. And I don't mean that he is, he's frustrated a bit. He's what I would call livid. I find this interesting in and of itself because with many of our biblical characters, we're not told what emotions they're feeling. The Hebrew in Jonah chapter 4 verse 1 is roughly translated, it was evil to Jonah and it burned him. What a wimpy translation into English, which is, this was very displeasing to to Jonah, and he became angry. No. It was evil to Jonah, and it burned him. It seems kind of rough to translate that Jonah saw God's actions to be evil. 
But let's backtrack a bit. What could God have done that made Jonah so mad? The part of the story that we all remember, Jonah getting swallowed by a whale and vomited back out, was because he ran away from God's command to preach and prophesy to the people of Nineveh. The people of Nineveh, for reasons not really elaborated on, were seen as wicked. Jonah was called to them to go to them, tell them to repent, or they would feel the greatest wrath from God. So Jonah, after running away and taking his sweet old time, ends up doing this. He goes to Nineveh and he prophesies. And what happens? It's likely the greatest mass conversion of people and animals in the entire Bible. The entire city of 120,000 people and their animals repented. They turned around and their lives changed. So what does God do? Instead of showing wrath like Jonah had prophesied, God spares the city. And this is what angers Jonah. He is so mad, he is burning and sees this act of redemption as evil. God shows mercy and compassion to those who do right. And Jonah is livid. Jonah and God go through this tense back and forth over the next few verses. Jonah is so upset that he tells God it would be better for him to die than to live. He throws back a famous line that is reiterated throughout the Old Testament, that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. But he says it in a way that almost seems sarcastic. He is burning with anger, after all. God responds to Jonah and says, Is it right for you to be angry? Or literally in Hebrew, is it good that it burns you? Jonah doesn't respond. He heads right out of the city and builds himself a booth to sit under while he waits to see what the fate of the city will be. Booths like the one that Jonah sat under were a means of protection against the elements. They often had roofs made of leaves or organic matter. So I think that what happens next is even more interesting and maybe even a bit comical. God appoints a bush to grow over Jonah. Mind you, he already has a booth to protect him from the elements. The bush grows so large that it provides extra shade for Jonah. and He's quite happy and uh, relieved that he has all this extra shade and gets to watch and see what happens to the people of Nineveh. It's the first time Jonah is happy in the entire story. But the bush lives for one day before God has a worm attack it and the bush dies. Jonah now has to deal with the hot sun beating down upon him. He becomes faint and tells God once again, it is better for me to die than to live. But God hits right back. Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? Or literally, is it good that it burns you about the bush? And Jonah, in all of his inner turmoil, responds, yes, angry enough to die. Now I want to pause on this part of the story because this is the very last thing that we hear from Jonah. Jonah is so angry about what God has done, saving 120,000 people, that he is willing to sit outside of the city walls, staring at the city until God does what Jonah wants. And when Jonah realizes God is not going to destroy the city, he asks for destruction upon himself. God did not tell Jonah to go sit outside the city. God did not tell Jonah to build the booth. This is the first time that God hasn't requested anything of Jonah. Jonah has done his part. And yet he does not like the end result. He doesn't have to sit outside the city. 
boiling under the sun until he faints. He chose that. There's something deep within me that wants to know why Jonah is so angry. Is his anger against God justified? I mean, perhaps he wouldn't be the first person to get angry at God. Some people want to look at Jonah and see that he's seeking some kind of justice that that God just chooses not to enact. But God never mentions justice here. We know that the people of Nineveh had a seedy and bad reputation, but we're not told why. Perhaps Jonah had some personal axe to grind and thought, God will inevitably side with me. I am one of God's Hebrew people. One man over 120,000. I see so many parallels within the book of Jonah to life today. We're the most divided that we've ever been, and not, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And this divide is so deep that it has pitted Christian against Christian, many choosing to believe that God is truly on their side over that of another believer. Some days feel hopeless, as if the world has given up on redemption or reconciliation with one another. I think at times, we've all got a little bit of Jonah in us, believing that if if we follow what God tells us to do, and we do what we think is right, that inevitably, whatever happens will benefit us. And maybe... There's a little bit of vengeance in there that kind of leaps with joy when we see something happen that we think is what should, that God has sided with us. So the last thing that we hear from the entire book is from God. God says to Jonah, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. And should I not also be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Who in today's world is allowed to long for God? Like Jonah, have we decided for ourselves whom God has chosen? If so, where does redemption and reconciliation lie with others who seem to be so different from us? Where does it lie for those who profess to believe in the same God as us and yet live out that belief so very differently? Is it our understanding of redemption that gets the last word? Or is it God's? I shared the story of our senior high campers because... In addition to teaching them about God and faith, we're also teaching them about living in a world that doesn't always see eye to eye on our beliefs. We're teaching them to hold space for others who experience life, faith, and the living God in different ways each and every day. We're teaching them love, compassion, and mercy as they sit across from one another sharing their beliefs in a holy space even when some of those beliefs do not match up with their peers. We're teaching them that each one of them longs for God, and God meets them from where they're at. And God is always willing to meet them there, ready to provide mercy and love when we least expect it. In these spaces of holy tension, we find what true reconciliation and redemption looks like. We can come together with all of our deepest feelings, be they anger like Jonah, or hurt, love, fear, and worry, and others can hold that with us. We don't hear a response from Jonah. After God says the last word, we don't know if Jonah's heart changed. If he got up from that booth ready to move on and do God's work in the world, or if he just continued to sit there under the hot sun, ready and willing to die. 
You know, God isn't saying to Jonah, don't be angry. God's just asking Jonah, is this good or right for you? Are we to fester in anger, disappointment, and bitterness while we watch other people be transformed by God? But maybe it doesn't fit the way we think it should. As others are transformed, where is God asking us what is right for our own lives? Where is God pushing us, like Jonah, to be transformed? Is there a space where we can let go of wrongs that may haunt us and weigh us down? So who is longing to be heard? I think it's both God and Jonah. Our God is such that we can come to our creator with the roughest versions of ourselves, our very worst days, even our jealous and vengeful days. And God is ready and waiting to meet us with open arms. God is ready for us and those that we clash with. Mercy and grace is wide open to both parties. Are we ready after our prayers of need and frustration? Are we ready for prayers of transformation? Unlike Jonah, are we ready to pray for our hearts to be transformed as much as we're willing to ask God to transform the hearts of others? Imagine God pulling you toward the transformation and reconciliation of the world with our own transformation at the front of the line. Where is our part in that? Please stand if that's comfortable for you and join me in our affirmation of faith. As disciples of Jesus Christ, let us affirm our faith and trust in him. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God, we hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Please be seated. As Reverend Fleming would normally say at this time, this is where we pause to give thanks for what we have and to remember our call as Christians to share with those who are less fortunate, the needy, the homeless, the oppressed, the lonely. For those that are able to contribute in, to the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church, thank you. You may send in checks or you may give online, as many of us do. It's been like everything else in today's world. Giving online and is made very, very easy if you go to our website. So thank you on behalf of Kevin and the um, session and everyone here at First Pres for your generous contributions in the life, the work, the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church. 
When we present our offering this morning, how do you think God will feel? Will God respond with, that was wonderful, you really shouldn't have done it. Your generosity pleases me, thank you for your generous gift. What we believe, or we believe that God does care, and thank you for adding God to God's joy through your faithfulness and generosity. Let us pray. O oh God, through the offering of these gifts, may we become a more open people, open-minded in hearing your word and wisdom, open-hearted in healing a broken world, open-handed in heeding your call for charity and enacted love. With thanks for all good gifts, we present a portion of our substance and the whole of ourselves. Amen. Before we join together for communion, I'd like to open up um, for the sharing of joys and concerns and prayer requests um, within the congregation. Thank you. Prayers have been asked for the Sponseller family, for all who are ill or infirm, for the lonely, especially those isolated in residential facilities, for Pastor Fleming as he renews himself. Gratitude for Molly's presence with us this morning for therapists and the therapies, for Marie and her family. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south, south and sit at this table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share in this feast which he has prepared. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Remember your church, the blessed members of its body who live and work to serve you. Even when we may be apart, we are forever one body. Unite us in faith and spirit and show your face to us in ever new and transforming ways. We lift up our community those who are sick or in need, and those seeking comfort. We pray for the Sponseller family, for all those who are in need of your comfort and loving care. For those who may feel alone, may your presence remind them that they are never alone. We pray for Kevin as he seeks renewal and rest in this period. And we pray for all those within our community, those who we have shared and those whose prayers sit kindly and comfortably on our hearts. May you be with all people who are weary and in need of rest. We give thanks to you this day as we join together in the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For each time that you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim my saving grace until I come again. Friends, the gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ broken for you. and the cup of salvation poured out for you. Friends, let us pray together. God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen.
Friends, I pray that as you go from this place, you know that God is at work transforming each and every one of our hearts each and every day. May we seek to do God's will in the world with open and eager hearts and minds, knowing that God is extending mercy to us and to our neighbor. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.